we should have gone into the Darklands to film this video. Yeah, but you know the problem with this. You don't just simply walk into it. Yeah, but what if you had to? What if you were the hero of J.R. Tolkien's novel and you wanted to cast some piece of jewelry into the fires below the mountain? What way would you actually choose? Well, the heroes in the novel certainly spend some time deliberating what the best route is. Yeah, but do they actually do a good job? Do they actually find the shortest path? Welcome back to Complexity Papers. This is the second lecture in the Networks and Complexity course. If you haven't seen the first one yet, check it out. Link is in the description. So, in this one, the challenge is how to find the shortest path to a given destination. How would you actually do that? Well, I guess you would use a map. And in the present day and age, you might use something like Google Maps to find the path for you. However, what if you haven't got a map? What if maybe you're addressing a challenge that is not in geographical space? So maybe there can never be a map or so. In this lecture, we are going to arrive at an elegant solution for the shortest path problem. And the algorithm that we discover is basically what Google Maps does when it finds the shortest path for you. Of course, this is another networks problem, where nodes now represent places and links represent roads connecting them. Mathematically speaking, a route across a network is called a walk. And if a walk contains every node at most once, so that we don't go back to the same place that we have already visited, then we can also call it a path. Now, for our present problem, we can be pretty sure that we don't want to revisit places because we want to actually get somewhere, right? So our solution will be a pass. Paths actually play a big role in the mathematical study of networks because they allow us to define certain other terms. See, in the last lecture, I just said components are the connected bits. And that was a colloquial definition that hopefully made sense to you. But it's hardly precise. Now that we have paths, we can make it more precise. We can say that two nodes, say A and B, are in the same component if and only if a path exists that has these two nodes as its endpoints. This is still not a precise definition of what a component is, but I think you get the idea. Let's get back to our actual problem. To solve this problem, we need a distance matrix, which gave me a convenient excuse to reread the books. The result is this, the distance matrix between places in Middle Earth in terms of Hobbit days. Note that this distance matrix is slightly different from the one that we saw in lecture one. For starters, there are some combinations of places now which don't have a direct road between them. So there is no direct distance between them. I represented this in this matrix by putting this O slash symbol. Moreover, you might have already spotted that this matrix is not symmetric. Why is this? Well, for example, the weather top is actually a big hill. So climbing it from Bray apparently takes one day longer than walking back down. Networks that have this asymmetry are called directed graphs or digraphs for short in mathematics. If you want to emphasize that for a link, a directionality matters, we can call it a directed link or an arc. Well, on the other hand, if you want to emphasize that a network is not directed, we can call it an undirected graph. And for a link, if you want to say that it goes both ways, we can call it bidirectional. Distance matrices are nice, and in this course we will actually use them a lot. But for the present problem, a different representation of the distances is actually advantageous. So this here, this is a link list. And this is actually closer to how we would represent the distances in a computer program. So how do we actually find the shortest path in a network? To figure this out, let's look at this little example. This is a network where the numbers on the links represent distances in Hobbit days. And we want to find a path from node A to node D. So I've made this example such that it's not completely trivial, but also so simple that we can definitely solve it. So let's solve it and then we will analyze 
what we were actually thinking when we did. Have you found the solution already? Yeah, the shortest path from A to D is ACBD. And it is four days long. But how did you find the solution? Well, I approached this problem from the left. And I might have thought something like this. Oh, it's rather expensive to go to B because that's four days away, while I can get to C in one day. But then I realized, hey, if I go via C, I can actually go to B in two days. So yeah, I discovered a faster route to B. So you could think, while I was solving this, I was constantly updating my expectations, how far different places are from the start. So part of the solution for discovering the shortest path to D was to first discover the shortest path to B. Interesting, isn't it? Does this actually remind you of anything? Well, in the first lecture we said that if you have a problem that is subject to a structural constraint and to an optimality constraint, then it's usually a good idea to first relax the structural constraint and then slowly bring it back. Is the current problem like that? Let's see. We are looking for paths that lead to our destination, and that is a structural constraint. And also, we want these paths to be the shortest ones, so that is an optimality constraint. And how have we solved it in the small problem? We have first relaxed the structural constraint by finding optimal paths that do not lead to the desired destination. For small networks that we can draw on a piece of paper, actually scribbling the distance estimates from the start like this onto the page gives us a very quick solution usually. To solve the problem in larger networks, we have to be a bit more organized. So let's see how this works out. To keep track of our distance estimates, I have made this table. In the header up here, we have all the places which appear with three-letter airport-style abbreviations. Our starting point is Hobbiton, right here. And our destination is Mount Doom, which appears by its true name, the Oro Druin. In this table, we are going to record the length of the shortest path that we have found so far to the respective locations. Because Hobbiton is our starting point, we can be pretty sure that we can reach it within zero days from the start. The other places, well, without consulting our distances, they might as well be infinitely far away. So let's actually enter these infinities here. They are an upper bound to how long it might take to go there. We can now improve our distance estimates by considering the roads from Hobbiton. Let's consult our linked list. We can see here that from Hobbiton, I can go to Bray in six days, and I can go to Isengard in 49 days. So this gives us better estimates for these two places. I can be in Bray on day six, and I can be in Isengard on day 49. Perhaps you're wondering why I'm starting a new row now. Well, the way in which this is going to work is that each row represents a different estimate, and there's a reason for that. But for now, let's just say the first row is the estimates that we can write without considering the linked list at all. And now in the second row, we are going to write the estimate that we can make after we have considered the linked list from our starting point. So each row will represent our estimates after we have updated from one particular place. In this update, we don't find shorter paths to any of the other places. So we just copy the entries from the previous row, but with one important exception. For Hobbiton, I'm actually sure that the zero will never change again. So I actually don't write it again. This is just a little trick for remembering that I'm already sure that I found the best way to get to this place. We are now done with our first update. So it's time to update again. But where should we update from? Obviously, there's no point in updating from Hobbiton again. So do we update from Bray or from Isengard? Actually, there's a very good reason to update from Bray. I will tell you about it in a minute, but let's first do the update. From Bray, we can go to Hobbiton in six days, but obviously there's no point in going back to a place that we are already sure about. Alternatively, we can go from Bray to Isengard in 48 days. But our journey starts in Hobbiton, so if we were to go from Hobbiton 
to Isengard via Bray. We need six days to Bray and then 48 days to Isengard. That will put us in Isengard on day 54. But we have already discovered a better route that takes us to Isengard on day 49. So let's keep the better one and we forget about the 54 days. Finally, there's a road from Bray to the weather top that takes seven days. So because we need six days to get to Bray and then seven days to go from Bray to the weather top, this allows us to be at the weather top on day 13. So that is much less than infinity. So let's enter this in our table. Oh, and by the way, I'm not actually making another entry for Bray because I think we are sure about the shortest path to Bray already. Why is that? Well, there's no other place that is closer to Hobbiton than Bray. And we've considered all the roads from Hobbiton already. This was also the reason why it is better to update from Bray than from Isengard. We are not sure about the distance to Isengard yet. And if we updated from there now and then found another shortcut to Isengard, we would have to redo these updates again. But if we are already sure about the shortest path to a place, then we can update from there and we will never have to consider it again. And fortunately, there's always one such place that we haven't considered yet. So from where should we update next? I guess you spotted it. It's a weather top. Why the weather top? Well, because it's now the closest place to the start from which we haven't updated yet. Now we can be sure that the distance to the weather top is really 13 days. So no risk of finding more shortcuts to it. That means we can now safely update from there. The link list shows that there's a road to Bray that takes six days. But that will put us in Bray on day 19. And we have already found a shorter path there. And anyway, we know we already found the shortest route to Bray. So we don't need to bother with that. The other way is to go to Rivendell in 17 days. So that gets us to Rivendell on day 30, which is much less than infinity. So yeah, that's one we want to have. So let's put this on our table. From this point on, there aren't really many big surprises. So let me just fill in the rest of the table now. What I do here is in every step, I pick the closest place to the start from which I haven't updated yet. In every update, I calculate the distances to the places that I can now reach from the place I'm updating from. Each of these distances is a sum of two numbers. The distance from the start to the place we're updating from, which we can find from our table, and the distance from the place we're updating from to the new destination, which we can find in the linked list. And if the result of the summation gives me a shorter distance to one of the places in the list than I currently have, well, then I update it. And otherwise, I keep the previous value. This is actually a good thing to remember when you do this. The values in the table always need to go down. They can never go up. We are looking for shorter paths, not longer ones. We repeat this process till the whole table is filled, or at least until we are sure about the true distance to our ultimate destination that we want to reach. As a result of this procedure, we now know the true distance to every location. But that's not really what we set out to achieve, is it? We wanted to have the shortest path to the desired destination. But that is something that is very easy to find now. See, in our table, we can actually spot the point where we found the shortest path to the destination. It is here where the distance decreases for the final time. That's where we found the shortest way to get there. Now, where were we updating from when we found this path? Well, it was from Cyrus Ungol. How can I see this? The column of Cyrus Ungol ends at the same line where I have this discovery of the shortest path to the Oryd Ruin. So that means that that was a point where I was sure about Cyrus Ungol. So that must have been the place where we updated from. We can now also find out when we found the shortest distance to Cyrus Ungol. It must have been in this step where the distance to Cyrus Ungol updates for the last time. In that step, we can see that we updated from Osgiliad. By repeating this procedure, we can actually backtrack till we arrive back at the start in Hobbiton. But now we know how to walk. Hobbiton, Bray, 
The Weathertop, Rivendell, Lorian, Osgiliad, Cyrus Ongol, and then Mount Doom itself, the Aura Druid. That's not quite the path they take in the book, but I will leave it to the ring nerds in the audience to figure out where they diverge and why. The algorithm that we arrived at in this lecture is called Dijkstra's algorithm, after its inventor, Dutch computer scientist, Edsger Dijkstra. The original problem was about finding your way to this place, the city of Honingen in the Netherlands. And I can't really blame Dijkstra for that, because this is a pretty cool place. So who wouldn't want to come here in the shortest possible way? I have one final question left for you. What kind of problem-solving strategy does Dijkstra actually use? On the internet, many people seem to believe that this is just another case of a greedy algorithm. But I want to convince you that this is not true, and we will get there in the second part of this lecture. You could actually watch it right now, or you could first join me for some exercises and never lose your pass again. Actually, sounds tempting if I put it like this, doesn't it? Anyway, see you in the next one.